on, guys? Sean Birdsong here, Sharon Lettelon. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Court. Today we have a special, special guest with us. We have uh, currently in Portugal, professional basketball player, um, the NCAA 2020 Inspiration Award recipient, and the founder mm -hmm. of 24 Reasons, Mr. Trey Moses. What's going on, sir? How are you guys doing? We're doing good here in the States. Missing you. <laughs> I know. Miss you guys. <laughs> so you're over in Portugal right now. How is that going? I know it's probably around 11 o'clock-ish or so right now. Um, can you talk about, like, what's going on with you? Um, are you guys about to prepare for the season? Or are you just wrapping up? What, what's going on over there? Yeah, we're about to wrap up season. Uh, you know, we've been going since August. Um, oh. We have our last regular season game Saturday. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't make the playoffs. We missed out by one game, but oh, man. Uh, we'll have a little uh, lo a little play out series uh, the following weekend. Um, and then we'll play another game after that and then we'll be home. So uh, counting down the day so till I can come home. Right, right. Now, you know, we're going to get into your career here in a little bit. The NCAA tournament just wrapped up. You know, obviously you played at Ball State. Um, have you been able to keep track of the NCAA tournament and also the NBA right now while you're over there? Or are you really just focused on what's going on overseas right now? Yeah, so I didn't watch much college basketball this year. I um, I watched probably three or four Ball State games, but that was about it. Um, but I did win my NCAA family's bracket. Okay. So easy money right there. <laughs> I had uh, I actually had Baylor and Gonzaga in the finals and Baylor winning. Um, but um, NBA wise, I, I kind of just keep up with it. I don't really watch too many games, um, but I do like to watch highlights and, and scores and check up on it, you know, kind of when I wake up in the morning. Okay. All right. Now you're from Louisville. Um, can you kind of talk about, you know, before your journey, where it all started, you know, for you in Louisville, what was your upbringing like? And was sports always a part of your, your, your household? Yeah, so my parents divorced when I was young, so probably like two or three. Yeah. Um, and so I lived with my mom, and uh, my dad would get me on the weekends or every other weekend. Um, but I think, like, I kind of joke about it, but I think my parents' like relationship is so weird because it's like they're best friends in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> like when I was in college, my dad was living <laughs> with my mom for like two or three years while my mom's fiance was living with my mom as well oh okay. so, so so i feel like you know that doesn't happen often right um, but i'm very blessed with that so um you know with that being said like sports were a big part of my life growing up so they were both able to um you know be there at my sporting events and get along and um although they don't my mom doesn't like sitting next to my dad because he yells a lot um, but they're, they're still able to get along and, um, you know, very blessed with that, uh, basketball and football is kind of was for my two main sports. Um, and I chose basketball going into high school. Right. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. So I'm going to jump into, cause I, I know you're, thank you again for being with us here. And it's kind of crazy, the time distance, but, um, you're an advocate for mental health and especially today, you know, with the pandemic and everything's going, it's become such an issue, you know, around. So at what age did you think that you think you start to feel that mental health experience will be a part of your life? Was it earlier or just during the college years? Yeah, so seventh grade was the first time that I can really remember. I remember, um, you know, I, I kind of talk about it a, a little bit, but you know, before that, I would say I was a, an emotional kid. I felt mm -hmm. like I was crying more than most. Um, I, I, there was never like an exact reason for it, but I just remember I was kind of just always sad. And, you know, not a lot of people saw me that way. So it's not like anyone's to kind of blame for it not being known. Um, but I kind of think about that now and like, okay, maybe it really did start earlier than when I kind of realized mm -hmm. it. Um, but I remember seventh grade, I remember writing mm -hmm. a kind of like a note or a letter to one of my friends who I was close with and pretty much telling her that like I didn't want to be alive mm -hmm. um and it was kind of like you know I had everything I had went to a great school had great friends great mm -hmm. family like played basketball like I had all these things that you know everyone could want 
Um, mm-hmm. and I, I now know that none of that matters in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but looking back, you know, that's how I kind of felt. But, um, you know, she ended up telling the counselor and I kind of made some kind of BS story about what was going on. And it, it never was talked about again um, with the counselor. And I kind of, I'm kind of like, you know, if that, that I could have been another statistic in a sense and because they didn't take it more seriously. Um, and I'm kind of glad that mental health um, is kind of starting to be taken more seriously. So any kind of issues like that, I feel like is getting taken more seriously inside our schools because I feel like it does start earlier for, for our generation. I, I definitely think um, what you said was right on point um, because mental health, it doesn't have any age. It really doesn't have any age and people don't realize that. And just growing up in this environment of the social media that everything is being watched from the time you're you're born now, you know, people, you know, online, it leads to an open door with issues. And again, everybody says, you know, oh, you have everything, what's wrong with you? No, you know, absolutely. So that's gonna go into another question. When you, uh, when you start playing your basketball, you got your talent, and I know you went to Ball State. Did you even think about getting a scholarship? How, tell me a little bit about your basketball journey of you know seeing where it was going to lead you professionally. So when I I um, my dad was kind of he's a bigger football fan than basketball fan. So when I kind of made, told him that I would rather just play basketball, uh, it was kind of like he was like, "Dang, like okay," but he was you know he was <laughs> like, "You're going to make this decision." you're going to give it all you got um, where, where I'm not going to let you slack and we're just going to give it all you got. Um, but then it was crazy because my freshman year of high school, I broke my leg. I had a femur fracture. And so with that, they were like, you know, you're not going to grow anymore. Like your right leg's going to be um, shorter than your left. And I was six, three at the time. And so obviously I grew, but I grew six inches within three years. Um, but I, I wouldn't say like I was highly recruited over my freshman, sophomore, junior year. Um, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until my junior summer going into my senior year, um, probably like July to August is where I kind of had my big jump and I had 12 division one offers. Um, and I took a couple of visits and then Ball State was kind of the school I fell in love with and, um, you know, very thankful I chose it. No. That leads right into the next question. Um, so you went to Ball State. Um, what what was it like? And what did you make you come to Ball State? I know that's where you started your freshman year. You met one of your best friends, Zach. And um, what was it when you, you know, chose Ball State that led you there, down the path? And then I guess it made a great significance with your life for me and your friend. And, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so for me, I was um, I was a special education major coming in. I okay. knew that's what I wanted to do, um, but I ended up changing majors. But the, some of the schools I was that were recruiting me didn't really have it. Um, okay. So my final five, I only, I only got to visit one school before Ball State, and that was VMI, and they only had fourteen majors at the time, mm. and it wasn't special. Like they didn't have really any education, I don't think. Um, and so I knew that wasn't for me. But then I got to Ball State, just fell in love with the coaching staff, their dedication um, to players on and off the court um, and kind of seeing that, you know, because the two years before I got there, they had five wins and seven wins. Um, and so you, I look at it and it's like, OK, like, you know what, you know, I could what who really wants to go to a kind of a losing program in a sense. Um, but I could tell they were kind of going in the right direction. Um, in my freshman year, we won 21 games. Um, and kind of had a great, you know, my junior and senior year were a little rougher, but, you know, we had a great uh, four years in a sense. But um, so education wise, is kind of why I chose Ball State along with um, feeling like we were going to have a big leap uh, my freshman year moving forward. Right. And, and that's where you met Zachary. Can you tell us a little bit about your friendship with yeah, so my sophomore year was when I met Zach. He was an incoming freshman. Um, and so he ended up redshirting that year, so we didn't get to play together. But he was one of those um, he, he was one of those guys that just lit up the room with a smile. Uh, you wanted to be around him. 
Um, and he was also a wanting to be a special education major. Okay. And so that's kind of where we really connected. Um, his first weekend on campus, his, because, you know, uh, basketball players have to be there during the summer. Okay. Um, well, his first weekend on campus, he came home with me because I host um, basketball camps for different Down syndrome organizations. Wow. Um, and so that weekend is kind of when we really became close. Like I knew of him, obviously he committed um, to Ball State, but that weekend, you know, stayed with my family and we just had a great time. Um got to learn a lot about each other. We just became super close. And um, I think with everything outside of basketball, it mm -hmm. made us want to push each other inside of basketball. When, when we wanted to see each other grow as much as we could um, and, and just make each other better all, on and off the court. Right. Now, you know, um, Zach, Zach Hollywood's his name. Um, I read an article um, and it talked about, you know, um, your friendship with him and some of what you're describing about, you know, the off the court, you know, you guys hanging out and, and all of that, I guess, basically creating a bond um, with each other. You know, unfortunately, during that time, you know, you know, I, I guess he had some um, mental health issues going on himself. And unfortunately, he, you know, committed suicide. What do you think um, that did for yourself and the program um and you know if you could speak about it were there any I guess signs that you say you could see from from your friend at that time because I know there's a lot of kids that um come into you know college they they leave their homes and it's a new environment so it's almost like you know you've always had kids come to college and then they can't take college so they come home and yeah. get a job or whatever but do you did you see any signs or anything that would um you know, that probably contributed to, to what happened with him? Yeah, I mean, I know it's tough. Uh, he had lost his mom a year earlier. Um, so I know that was um, super tough for him to go through. Um, and, you know, we were all there for him through that. But, uh, you know, losing a, a parent is never easy, especially yes. one that's, you know, so young. And then um, I know he ended up having the disease that his mom passed from. And so that was kind of, hard for him to mentally take and you know there was other factors but um you know I think we knew what he was going through in a sense because uh the next week he was starting counseling um so we we all had his back we all knew um not we all knew but um the ones closest to him knew you know he was on the right path to getting help and getting to where he um where he wanted and needed to be um the night before was my birthday party. And um, I, you know, I say this to everyone, my best memory is that night because I remember looking over and seeing how happy he was. Like, I, I, I think about it all the time. Like I can really just see that image and how happy he was, how he smiled through the entire night. Um, and I remember him giving me a hug and telling me bye, he loved me. Um, and so it's just one of those things where it's like, wow, like, this this is the turning point you know I knew he was going through so much and I'd gone through so much and this is kind of the turning point of that and now he's gonna you know he's on that path to, to getting better um and unfortunately you know the next morning um you know things just happened to, to go a different way and um you know it's tough um but as far as the program I would say it made our team closer. Um, I hate that tragedy brought us together. Um, you know, it's kind of when I speak to programs, I, I always let them know, don't let tragedy bring you guys closer. Like start working on that bond now um, because there's, you just don't want loss to bring you closer. Um, but, you know, we had, we had a tough year that year. We lost three teammates. We lost one to, you know, obviously Zach. And then we lost two other guys to, um, not pretty much um, off the court issues. Um, so we had a very up and down year and that was supposed to really be a year that we shocked a lot of people. Um, and, you know, we still played well, even to, given the, everything we went through. And then me individually, um, I found my relationship with the Lord. I ended up getting baptized that December. Um, that happened in mm -hmm. August, but I got baptized that December. And, um, you know, like I always say, too, like, I hate that tragedy brought me closer to, to God. Um, mm -hmm. But here I am still. So, um, 
very thankful to have that relationship and to, to have, um, you know, I always say that it's, um, God doesn't promise us an easy life, but he promises a life of uh, not being alone. Um, right. and so those are kind of the two big things in the individually and as a team. Right. Now you, you know, being a former student athlete, um, there are a lot of young adults and even adults who struggle, you know, with mental health. Do you think it's tougher on student athletes uh, with mental health, or do you think it's like, it could be a variation of things? Cause I always looked at like, of course, being a former student athlete myself, you got school, you got practices, you got games, you got travel, you have all this other stuff going on and you have to keep up with the schedule. Do you think that's pressure on a lot of people or what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it is a lot of pressure. Um, but I also think that having a coach that understands is, is awesome. I was very blessed with having a coach. Um, before, even before Zach happened, my freshman year, I was crying before practice. And my trainer, my student advisor knew everything that was going on with me as far as mental health. I was just diagnosed having severe depression. Um, I was in counseling and my trainer was like, I think you need to talk to Coach Witt. I think it's time. I think I think we'll be understanding. And I remember him walking in as I'm crying in the, in the training room. He's just like, go home, big fella. Just take today off. I'll tell the guys you're sick when you're ready. You can tell them. But, you know, until then, like, I'm, I'm here for you. And, and mm-hmm. so for me, that was that, like, no offense to my dad, but that was like the first male that I had mm-hmm. that really showed me that love as far yeah. as that mental health. Right. And I think that's a, a fear that a lot of athletes have is, in sports mm-hmm. in general, because it's like, we have to be tough. You know, if, if we're not tough, we're, look, we're weak, we're soft, we're all these other things. Right. But you know, everyone always say you have to take care of your mental health, just like an injury. You know, you're, you're not just going to keep going on a broken leg or a sprain. Like you gotta, you gotta take care of your mental health the same way. Um, so I think it, you know, it starts up top of the coaches. Um, I yeah. think it's important that coaches kind of understand what their athletes are truly going through. And that we have lives outside of basketball and school. You know, some people have stuff back home. Some people come from some, from tough neighborhoods, tough households. Exactly. Some people are dealing with relationship issues. You know, there's all these other things outside of basketball that, um, you know, we deal with. And um, I was also blessed to speak at the final four in 2019 Mm -hmm. um, to coaches about, you know, mental health and athletes. And I was giving the same stuff. And it um, it, it was just awesome being able to, to kind of talk about this stuff and, see coaches and have them come up and talk to me it was like everything you said like you know it makes sense I'm gonna take it back to my team yeah I love what you said it's like it's okay to not to say you're not okay you know um and everyone is kind of getting that issue with mental health uh people see something just on the outside she's fine she's happy she's doing all these things I remember when Megan Marco said you know it's okay to say you're not okay. And you never know what's going on behind closed doors. And I also mean closed doors could not just be a home. It could also be closed doors of your mind, you know? I think um, one of the, I don't mean to cut you off. I think one no, of the best ahead. stories that I've heard was um, one of my teammates was telling me, he was like, there was, um, you know, a girl on a bus and like a guy just walks on and she says hi to him. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later goes by. She she didn't make a big deal. She just said hi. She wasn't a big thing. A couple of weeks later, he comes back up to her and was like, you know, when you said hi to me, I, I plan to go home and take my life that day. But you saying hi to me, mm-hmm. that showed me that someone cares. Right. And, you know, you we just don't know what's going on with people. And I always say, just say hi. You know, it's obviously harder with a pandemic going on, but. I think you're just checking in on people in general and just kind of trying to show support, even for strangers you may not know is, is important. Right, absolutely. That's I a think, great. you know, I, I always wanted to know, because, you know, I was on your show uh, this past summer and we had a lot of conversations, um, you know, about the pandemic and, you know, what was going on with you and, and everything with me. And I always wonder, you know, especially you being an advocate for mental health, how did you remain focused during time of tragedy, still going to school, 
basketball to where you parlayed that into going overseas and receiving a contract to go overseas? Like what kept your mind focused? Because honestly, and it's a testament to you, I don't know too many people who will go through that kind of tragedy and, you know, just still like, you know what, I want to go um, out of the country to play. You know, it's usually I want to stay home, you know, with my family, tighten it. What was going on through your mind during that time to keep you focused? So my junior year when that happened, um, <clears throat> I um, I also pulled my hamstring really bad. So I was out five and a half weeks. And, um, you know, it was just, it was already a tough year losing Zach. I mean, you have injury. Yeah. Um, and so it was one of those things where it was like, man, what am I doing? Like, do I really want this? Like, do I, do I want to keep going? Like, I, re I remember having a conversation mm -hmm. walking through my trainer in, in the middle of December, walking with him through the middle of the parking lot crying like, man, I think I want to transfer. Like, I don't know if I can handle, because I, you know, I was wearing Zach's number. Right. And this isn't something I've talked to a lot of people about, but it was like, I don't know that I can handle the pressure of that anymore. Right. Like I, I want, so I've put more pressure on me than anyone else has put on me because yeah. I want to just succeed for him. I want to play for him. I want to play for his family. That I didn't get to see him play in college. Like I want to do all these things for him. And it's like, I wasn't playing well, like all these different things, all these different aspects mm -hmm. of life. And, you know, it was tough. Um, and, you know, now being overseas, like it's still tough. And I don't really have put my, have that same pressure on myself, but it's one of those things where like, you know, you'll randomly have a, a trigger and it, it just makes you think of that. And you're like, someone sent me something yesterday, last night, and I I'm just started crying. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, you hate that it happened. You know, you, you really do. Um, you, there's so many different aspects of life that um, can affect the way someone passes. And it's not, you know, that's one of the most more unimaginable ones you, you, you question like what could you have done more what what could you have done better and for me like he called me four times that night and I was just asleep he left me two voice messages and I would tell you that those voice messages are what kept me going for the longest like I don't have those anymore um and I've only I only listened to him once I didn't want to let myself listen to him anymore but just hearing how proud of me he was how far he told me I could go in life in basketball and outside of basketball, like that's what kept me going. Someone that I loved so dearly loved and cared about so much, having so much faith in me. Um, so that's kind of just what has kept me going. It's kind of what I think about sometimes. And um, I would say probably that's my why. And it's, it's something I hadn't really thought about in a while, but I would tell you probably that's my why. Right. And, and it's so, crucial what you're sharing now because um you know what i try to express to people mental health is that there's no period of time that it's not to grieve you know there's no set time that you know nothing's a quick fix and that's why i said you know, tell people give yourself a break you know you can grieve you can grieve 10 years something could come up 10 years from now about a person you lost and it's, it's okay to be not okay at that moment, um, embrace it. And at the same time, I like how you're sharing, you took it as, as your mission and goal, but you can also sometimes give yourself a break, you know, give yeah. yourself a break. You know, God knows when you're gonna open your eyes for the first time and he knows when you're gonna close it. What you do in the middle is what, what can this define who you are as a, a character, but we're all imperfect. You know, you mentioned grieving, um, like I, I mentioned Coach Witt earlier, but, um, you know, after Zach, he immediately got us a sports psychologist. Um, he, uh, Dr. Carr, who's worked with the Packers uh, and with the Pacers. Um, and he, you know, was meeting with us once a month for, you know, falling. And then he would come up to campus. So if we wanted to have individuals with him, um, we would meet with him. But he had mentioned um, – like 12 different ways you could grieve um, and pretty much telling us that it is not our responsibility to judge others and how they grieve. And he was exactly. like, the people that are closest, that were closest with Zach will probably hit all 12. Um, and the people that weren't as close probably won't, but you know, it's not our job. It's not, it's not fair for us to, to 
judge how others grieve. Cause I remember myself two weeks after walking through campus, like how the F are you guys? Okay. Like, how are you guys still walk? Like, how are you guys doing it? Like I'm hood up trying to avoid the world. It's like, how are you guys walk? Like this doesn't affect you. It's like, these people didn't even know that they just heard like a basketball player on their, on their campus took their life and they didn't know him. So it's not my job to, uh, to judge others on how how they're grieving for one they didn't know zach and two that's not fair in general yeah. right you know you hit that on the head because you know even in my own life you know i've had um family members you know past loved ones passed and it's almost like you know even friends family members have passed and unless you're in that circle mm-hmm. you know i've heard it over and time over and over again everybody grieves differently but it's almost like in the midst of a tragedy or a midst of a death, everybody, I guess, is sensitive to the situation and you're wondering, well, why aren't they upset? You know, so that, that makes sense what, what you're saying. You know, you parlayed from, you know, college to professionally. And during, um, I believe it was a year and a half ago, during 2020, um, you were awarded by the NCAA, you know, for the inspiration, uh, you were an inspiration award recipient. Um, can you talk about that and what that meant to you and uh, what kind of things did you talk about um, when you received that award? Yeah, it was awesome. It was one of those things that um, during my senior year of college, um, our Dobo, Director of Basketball Operations, had said that he was going to nominate me for it. And I was just like, okay, like, okay, sounds good. Um, didn't really didn't really know what it was but he you know he told me I think he was like I think it's an award that uh, you know you, you deserve um, and then my as soon as I got to Bulgaria probably three or four days later I found out I actually won it um, I wasn't able to tell anyone I won well I, I could tell my family but I couldn't like post it out that I had won um, but it was one of those things where it's like Obviously, I don't do what I do for awards, um, for recognition, for anything, because one, it doesn't, it doesn't get me anything. Like there's no, um, I get nothing from it. And two, just knowing that I have, like my goal is to impact one person a day, try to just change one person's life. And if I, I feel like if I do that, um, then I'm slowly changing the world and slowly um and just impacting as many people as I can because if I impact you, you impact one. Like it just, it's just a trickling effect. Absolutely. And just knowing that I've I've done that, but you know I, I've done that to so many people. It, it's just a great feeling. Um, and you know, with or without the award, I know I've impacted a lot of people. And you know, I think one of the best things I, I kind of have heard is like through tragedy you can you know yeah. you can either choose to keep going or you can kind of let yourself just be silent now I, I wanted to keep going I wanted to to just impact people who have similar stories to myself um, because I feel like I have two mental health stories one is myself and two is losing um, mm-hmm. a loved one to taking their own life and so I feel like I want to help others who have gone through similar stuff that I have um, and so with this award, like it was, it was obviously awesome to win it. Um, but it's, you know, even better just to know that I'm, um, actually impacting people. And through the award, it also brings ish, a light on the issues that is passionate for you, you know? So, um, that's why I look at awards. If it's going to really communicate to a larger audience, what is your passion and what are the issues they need to look at, then that's wonderful. And you got to meet Sean and I. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> That's I how did. you met us in 2020. Also, <laughs> weekend, you see, if you weren't there, <laughs> exactly, that was you would awesome. have met us. <laughs> so, that was a fun night. Yeah, man, that it was, was. That, that was one of the best nights of my life. Was it J-Cole? And no talking about Everybody it. Everybody was in there. <laughs> <laughs> no talking about what happens in All Star stage and All Star week. <laughs> hold on, hold on. We have to tell this story though. Trey, do you know the story? No. With J. Cole, Sharon, you got to tell the story. All right. Real quick. <laughs> okay. So real quick, that night, one of the guys asked uh, me to, you know how I push it in front of everyone to, oh, that's Jay something. I, I want to get a picture. And I'm like, okay, you want to get a picture? Okay. You going to stop me? Uh, you know, because then I, 
So I go right up to his Druga. I'm like, hey, you, come here. He wants to take a picture. He's like, oh, okay. I said, okay, he got the picture. I said, so, so what do you do? He goes, <laughs> I, I, you know, I do some music and rap. I said, okay. I said, you know what? This is how I showed my age. I said, you should try YouTube. A lot of people discovered on YouTube. <laughs> That was so like, you, Trey, you can't make this up, man. He was like, you too. He started laughing. He goes, you're adorable. I said, no, no, no. Not my I said, but really? I can't believe this is my first time hearing this. Oh, yeah. that's what That was me that night. <laughs> so to make the story quick, when I came back, I'm showing my daughters because I'm posting pictures. I said, hey, to my daughters, uh, this person uh, says rapper, do you know who he is? That's Jay Cole. I'm like, oh, you see somebody? Mom, what did you say? I told him to go, oh my God, you did. I'm like, oh. I said, and she played a song. I said, oh, that's why he was laughing when they were playing his song and the thing, and I was dancing to him, like, oh, this guy's the beat. <laughs> this is that this is, is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, like I said, what happens in all stars stays in all stars. Now, Trey, you, you talked earlier about you know you helping people. Um, you know, in addition to you playing, you know, you speak to, you know, groups um, about mental health. Um, you also have your organization, 24 Reasons. Um, can you talk about 24 Reasons and wh where did that come about? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously the number 24 is important to me because um, because of Zach. Um, and so because of that, I wanted to, you know, create something bigger than the both of us, um, something that inspires others to, to find their reasons to keep going. Um, I think it's important because at times I think that we get so caught up in our heads mm -hmm. about what's going on that we forget about why we're going, where we're going, where we're wanting to go, where we want to be, our goals, our dreams, our aspirations. Um, and so because of that, um 24 reasons you know with every purchase 24 percent goes to charity one percent goes to 24 different charities we have Wonderful. um all different we have you know animal shelters we have mental health places we have all these different organizations that i know what it meant a lot to zach it mean a lot to me and um you know it's just we want to just inspire people to keep going um, and trying to, to really find the reasons because I feel like at times if we can get lost and kind of forget our reasons. Right. Now, what message would you give to, you know, youth and also adults due to the pandemic, even without the pandemic, just mm -hmm. str daily struggles they're going through, um, you being an advocate for mental health, what kind of advice would you give the youngins coming up and even adults right now? My first would be, um, you know, it's okay not to be okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to tell a quick story, but there was an or, there's an organization called Dear World, um, and they go around to different um, college campuses, and um, you know you'll see people write on their bodies, take a picture, and kind of tell their story with that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what they kind of did. Well, they were on at Ball State, and I you know I was with my roommate, and I was like, yeah, let's just go get our picture taken you know, get out of there. We were like there right before they closed. And I wrote on my hand, all you need is happy thoughts. And then the suicide hotline down my hand or down my arm. Um, all you need is happy thoughts from Chance the Rapper. He's um, impacting me quite a bit. Um, Coloring Book is, you know, the most inspirational album to me, uh, for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I took my picture I was wiping off, the lady comes up to me, he's like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Why are you wiping it off? I was just like, you know, I just took my picture. She's mm -hmm. like, tell me, you know, tell me about it. And so I kind of was telling her my story and how I just lost Zach, you know, probably three weeks ago. And she was like, you know, what if we wrote one more, one, or what if we took one more picture? Um, and right here on my arm, we wrote, um, he called four times. Um, and that's because Zach called me four times that night. And she was like, you know, what if, um, you know, would, would you be interested in talking tonight um, at our, or at our, um, at our show? Because they, they give um, mm -hmm. the college students a chance to, you know, kind of speak publicly about their stories in front of their, in front of their peers. And she's like, you know, we're, we're kind of all booked up in terms of speakers, but I think yours is an important message. Fine. And so that was my first time speaking publicly on it. 
And so I show up um, kind of an hour before to talk to her or to kind of write down what I was going to say, um, because one, I knew I was going to be emotional, so it's going to be hard to keep keep on track. And two, um, you know, I, I just felt it was best to kind of go over it. Um, and so I ended mine with, or I ended what I was going to say with, it's okay not to be okay. And she goes, what if we ended up with, it's okay not to be okay, because that's better than not being here. Um, yeah. And I think that, I think that was kind of the, the spark and the change and in, in everything for me, because it's like, I think we only think of, you know, it's okay to either be okay or not be okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we're in that fine line of, you know, where, where are we? We don't know where we are, yeah. you know, and, and sometimes we just got, we're still here. We're still alive. We're still breathing. We're still, you know, we're blessed to be alive. Um, and so I think that sometimes we, you know, we just gotta, just gotta be, be okay being in that fine line. Um, so that would kind of be my first point. And then my second would be, be honest about what you're going through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was always told not everyone needs to know just a few good people. Yeah. And so kind of communi communicating that to, to your good people. Um, if it's someone older than you, maybe they can, if you need real help as far as, you know, professional counseling, medication, whatever it is, they can help you get that hopefully. Um, and so my, when I speak to teams, it's kind of director of basketball operations, coaches can help you get counseling, can help you kind of mm -hmm. figure out what it is, if it's something um, that you feel like you, you want to just talk about. Because I feel like counseling is good, you know, whether you're sad, mad, unhappy, whatever it is, I think it's good to just be able to go to have another outlet to speak. I love that because I said a lot of times and think prior to COVID-19, the pandemic, psychiatries, psychiatrists had a stigma. You know, people like, oh, I didn't, didn't want to know that you went to a psychiatrist because they're like, what's wrong with you? But then now people are like, uh, they find that they're overbooked because people are like, yeah, it's just a talk. It's okay not to be okay. And having an impartial voice to just be a reflection of what's going on in your head. It's very, you know, mental health has been such, such a thing that's not been addressed. And I think it's being addressed much more because of what the world is going through, not just here in the States, but the world, you know, that why am I sad? You know, I still have a roof over my head. Why do I feel this? You know, I can still go to the grocery store. You know, I should be, it's okay to be blessed, but it's okay to still have the same type of things. Mm -hmm. because it's the uncertainty of this life which it's causing everything to implode but i definitely agree right. yeah now trey we ask every guest um it could be off the court on the court what does being an american baller mean to trey moses yes <laughs> um i would say impacting as many people as you can um i think that everyone has the ability to impact people, but not everybody wants to impact people because I think we live in a selfish world. Um, so just just impacting as many people as you can every single day. 100%. Now, where can people find uh, more information about uh, 24 Reasons and what you have going on? Uh, so we're uh, Instagram at 24 underscore reasons. Uh, we have a 24 Reasons Facebook page. Um, it's all it's in the link in my bio um, on my Instagram, Trey Moses 41. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Good. The last thing, when are you going to be back? Uh, my flight should be May 6th. Uh, we have a chance for it to be a couple days earlier, depending on if we win, um, win earlier, uh, but we'll see. Okay. All right. Well, we're rooting for you the rest of the season. Yes. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you guys. No problem. Okay. I, I appreciate your time, man. You being up this late in, in Portugal right now. Um, just want to thank you again for your time. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you guys. And, and look forward to seeing you when you're back, okay? Give me a yes, call. Yes, ma'am. I All got right. you. Thank All right, you. Dre. Bye.